A small quote from uh, Maggie that. Ross, picking cranberries in the Denali forest uh, in Alaska. She writes, this glory of cranberries and wilderness bestows humility in the radiance that captures us and is reflected in our faces. It is most present when we are least self-conscious, when our awareness is focused outside ourselves and we are briefly taken into a space where the ordinary preoccupations of time are laid aside. Above all, it is a gift as the cranberries themselves are a gift. This radiance is the trace of divine love that creates and sustains, lingering in all creation, no matter how muted it may seem. The ability to see this love depends on our receptivity to the gift of humility, which is contemplation, purity of heart, and peace, all rolled into one. The single virtue of which the paradoxes of the Beatitudes speak. We come to understand that only love can recognize love. It is only because we bear, each one of us, each fragment of creation, the trace of the divine, that we dimly realize the hunger crying out from every human heart can be fed by this radiance alone. Spirituality has been implicitly and explicitly weaving through this conference, um, especially beginning this morning. Um, and the quotation highlights the experience of God in and through the natural world and its unfolding journey. The self-revealing Trinitarian God of Christianity has continually revealed God's self not only through explicit revelation, but in and through the sacramentality of the creation itself and fully mystical awakening within this context. Spirituality offers practices that foster and shape potentially for, for such awakening uh, and the conversions of heart uh, of our behavior required by our burgeoning ecological awareness. So we, it's just woven all the way through implicitly and we turn now to our esteemed colleagues uh, presenting their papers. Uh, Kathleen Dagnan from Iona College and uh, the Berry Forum there, as well as uh, the Iona Spirituality Institute, which has done amazing work throughout the years. Kathleen. Thank you. I'd like to offer my salutation uh, to Thomas today and my act of gratitude to John and Mary in this song. Oh, you whose day it is, make it beautiful. Get out your rainbow colors, so it will be The journey of the universe has been a spiritual venture from the start, a mysterious, mind-boggling, heart-stopping wonder that our generation has come to know in its glorious unfolding more intimately and accurately than any other. And because the universe is a spiritual event, it's right to ponder how cosmological spirituality might continue to evolve in witness and wonder within the Christian form from our own heirloom seeds that we have garnered and gathered and from our original granaries in our Christian tradition. Most of us in this room have been activators of such seeds, creative and constructive cultivators of their vitality, so it might be interesting to review an early essay by Father Thomas and make current comment and also offer some unnoted perspectives 
as a way of developing our insights in light of his. So the article in question is The Spirituality of the Earth, published in 1990. In it, Thomas once again offers us an attitude adjustment in this summary statement. The subject with which we are concerned is the spirituality of the earth. By this, I do not mean a spiritual, spirituality that is directed toward an appreciation of the earth. I speak of the earth as subject, not as object. I'm concerned with the maternal principle out of which we were born and whence we derive all that we are and all that we have. In our totality, we are born of the earth. We are earthlings. In his characteristically rich and compact and provocative essay, Berry offers a comprehensive perspective for Christians who would engage in earth spirituality, of earth, for earth, in light of contemporary cosmology. And then he proposes some recoveries within the Christian tradition that I found constructive and in some ways even surprising. However, in each instance of his critique and challenge to Christianity, Thomas repeatedly turns from his, our tradition, to offer more compelling examples of his meaning from another. And therefore, in this, my own brief set of uh, notes for conversation, I'd like to offer in response to Father Thomas equally compelling resources from our own lineage which need to be recovered, creatively reintegrated into current Christian praxis, practice, so that we might accept his challenge to develop a thoroughly contemporary cosmic spirituality, a spirituality of Earth starting from our spirituality our experience, pardon me, as earthlings. So in this essay, in faithful Berrian fashion, the prophet consistently characterizes Christianity as a tradition which ironically uh, pays but lip service um, to the sacrality of the natural world. And with horrific consequences, he underscores the unconf unconfessed and unamended attack on indigenous American peoples and their earth mysticism. Also, we hear him reiterate his trope about the Christian preference for a redemption from the world orientation. And how tragically ironic for a thoroughly incarnational religion. And yet the denial of the sacrality of the natural world is not the whole story, nor is it constitutive of Christianity. In fact, the dominant motif of the Christian event is not simply a redemption of or out of the world by a messianic savior, but more essentially and originally, the long-awaited incendence of divinity into the cosmos, or in another metaphor, the flowering of divinity from within the universe, from the primordial logos or seminal word of creator. Even in the redemption focus of our earliest teachers, beginning with John and Paul, the various notions of the salvation proclamation um, actually articulate these themes, a liberation from the disoriented dominance of a spiritually arrested human community, a ripeness for a further cosmic maturation, a readiness for rebirth of creation itself to a fuller potential embodiment of divinity. The Christian story then offers our human situation, our human reality, the promise of emergence of a restored, renewed, a new creation perceived and received by those who would, like Jesus, their Christic exemplar, become a new kind of human, a new humankind to cultivate and care for it. Indeed, the gospel of the realm of God springs up to reveal a dynamic terrestrial and cosmic field of grace proclaimed by one who bore his divine humanity, his human divinity in ordinary and extraordinary ways. And the developmental transformational challenge of the Christian event, therefore, was and remains for us the human labor to voluntarily let 
Go, let die the old human, the old human anthropos, and take up the profound psycho-spiritual labor of birthing a new human, a faithful imago dei, the Christic. This, in other words, was the original Christian project, to borrow Thomas's phrase, to reinvent the human at the species level. So I think the question for us is, do we, in the Christian tradition, have our own spiritual teachings and techniques and technologies that are powerful enough, that are worthy, skillful means to aid us in realizing uh, Thomas's sense of the ecozoic human? How then, from the beginning, was this original and pivotal Earth-centered spirituality nurtured for the new Christic humanity and process? And so, I think we need to do, in some sense, this work of historical retrieval. And it is, of course, already underway. We've been hearing about it all, all weekend. Two modes of transformational practice. Learning to read the Book of Nature, the primordial scripture, and through the work of Theoria Physici, or Natural Contemplation. In 2002, rehearsing an ancient teaching, John Paul II reminded Christians that creation, creation itself, is the original revelation, speaking clearly to us about the Creator and leading us ever more deeply into the mystery of God's love. He said, for those who have attentive ears and open eyes, creation is like a first revelation that has its own eloquent language. It is almost another sacred book whose letters are represented by the multitude of creative things present in the universe. And then John Paul appeals to more ancient authority uh, in St. John Chrysostom and, and then to Athanasius. Athanasius, who says the firmament with its magnificence, its beauty, its order, is an admirable preacher of its maker whose eloquence fills the universe. So clearly, Earth-centered spirituality, therefore, is nothing new in Christianity. In fact, it's the very heart and soul of Christianity, since it celebrates the mystery of the incarnation of divinity into cosmic stuff, affirming creation as an unspeakable alphabet by which God spells out the inexhaustible beauty, creativity, splendor, the terrible beauty and magic of the divine milieu. So the scripture of creation and the Bible are coextensive our early teachers will affirm. Given the right interpretive tools, one can read the divine design from nature back into the Bible and vice versa. Now, um, in the paper that I have posted on the website, I rehearse a very long and explicit teaching on reading the book of creation and its many, many um, schools of teaching and interpretation. Um, starting with the Gospel of John, going through the teachings of St. Paul, uh, moving on to Irenaeus, um, to Athanasius, to Augustine of Hippo. I'd like to just read his little piece. Augustine says that some people, he noted, in order to discover God, read books. But there is a great book, the very appearance of created things. Look above you, look below you, read it, note it, God, whom you want to discover, never wrote a book like that in ink. Instead, God sets before our eyes the things that God had made. Can you ask for a louder voice than that? Why, heaven and earth shout to you, God made me. So this creation tradition had its many, many articulations again. Benedict of Nursia, Bernard, the Cistercians, the Victorines, the rich, earthy, cosmocentric spirituality of the Celts, the multimedia legacy of Hildegard of Bingen, uh, the Franciscans and Dominican schools with Bonaventure and Aquinas, with John Scotus Eriugena, who should have been up there a little earlier, uh, with <laughs> Meister Eckhart, with the Beguines, with Dame Julian of Norwich, Therese of Lisieux, who all lent their genius to this lineage. So most recently, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Teilhard in our own time, Thomas Merton, and some of my recent favorites, I'm sure you all know John O'Donohue, but please run out and get the books by John Moriarty. Um, these are extraordinary ecozoic human beings, and of course, the one we celebrate today, 
Thomas. So our challenge, therefore, is to reinstate, reintegrate, reanimate such intensive Christian praxis of Lexio Natura for the ongoing rebirth of the human species in the Christian form. And by the way, it's not just simply for us, but we need to recover this um, teaching and this skillful means so that we might offer it to the peoples of our planet. So the second and the last way I'll share with you the other mode of Earth-centered Christian spirituality uh, and the technique by which to awaken to it is the practice of Theoria Physici. I hope, if Father um, John is still here, that my Greek is working, um, which is natural contemplation. To understand the profound dimensions and demands of this teaching, it's interesting to take a look at the notes of Thomas Merton that he uh, put together while he was teaching this way of natural contemplation to his own novices down in Gethsemane. And the excerpts that, um, uh, that he shares are derived from the teachings of Maximus the Confessor on Theory of Physici, which of course is a stage in the contemplative transformation. Please read epistemological, psychic, developmental, or evolutionary transformation in which the practitioner labels, labors to sense actually to actually and truly see by way of gazing the divine presence in the created universe. This is what happens. The senses become so clarified, so clean, and so capable of perceiving divinity. Uh, Theoria Physici is then reception or receptivity to the mysterious, of the mysterious, the mysterious silent revelation of God in God's cosmos and in God's oikonomia. It is the knowledge of God that is natural to humankind, and therefore it's universal. Um, it is the knowledge proper to us. It is this intuition proper to us as divine offspring. And so we must be restored, first of all, to this kind of natural contemplation of the cosmos before we can move to those further thresholds of theosis and divinization uh, by way of uh, theologia. Uh, this contemplation is demanded by the cosmos itself, um, Maximus is going to say, and of history. For humanity um, cannot know creatures, but for if humanity cannot know creatures by such spiritual gnosis, that is to say by this intimate, affectionate, uh, mutual subjective knowing, we, humankind, will be frustrated in our existence and in the purpose of our existence. If humankind cannot spiritually penetrate the meaning of the oikonomia, we run the risk of being frustrated and souls will be lost. Um, this theoria is important for humankind's cooperation in the spiritualization and restoration of the cosmos, and of course, we would say of planet Earth, but most particularly. It is inseparable from love, and it is from a truly spiritual and benign, nonviolent conduct of life. We not only must see the inner meaning, that is to say the beauty, the subjectivity of things, but we have to be able to regulate our entire lives, our use of time and of created beings according to these mysterious norms hidden in things by the creation. The vision is Sophianic. I will leave that to Kathleen to describe. Um, and finally, um, in this great labor of um, natural contemplation, the human person begins to receive the radiance of which Janet was just speaking, of the cherries <coughs> and the berries. And we begin to take on that light, becoming a mirror ourselves of divine glory, resplendent with divine truth, not only in our minds, but in our practical lives, in our way of being human. And so the light that we are filled with the light of this wisdom which shines forth not only on created things but from created things and thus the God is glorified in us. There's much more to say, it's all online.
Thank you so much, Kathleen, for taking us into some of our deep roots further back in the tradition that also bring us forward into this new journey and this new cosmology. We turn now to uh, Kathleen Duffy, who comes to us from uh, Chestnut Hill College. And uh, she asked me for a shout out, which is more than easy to do. Uh, she has a new book, Tayhard's Mysticism, Seeing the Inner Face of Evolution. Kathleen was reminding me before we started this panel that she is a scientist. She teaches physics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are a couple. <laughs> There's at least one physicist in the audience, right? <laughs> so not only does Good. she teach physics, she is also um, steeped in Tehard. Thanks, Jen. <clears throat> so I want also to add my thanks to Mary Evelyn and John for this wonderful conference, and also to all of you. It's been so good to meet friends and to become friends with, with new people. So thank you very much. And May we continue to uh, grow in that way, in community. Much has been written about the power of story. Story teaches and entertains, but most of all, it provides a context in which to live our lives, which is why Thomas Berry encouraged scientists to tell the story of the universe. Universe story by Swim and Berry and Journey by uh, Swim and Tucker, are two of the most successful attempts at this, with Journey even attracting scientists formerly untouched by Barry's approach. Teilhard laid the foundation for the story in the human phenomenon, aiming to show the human as an integral part of Earth's evolutionary story, and to illustrate how, throughout the ages, Matter has been complexifying, and in proportion to its complexity, has been becoming more conscious. On the other hand, universe story and journey focus on connecting us to Earth's story so that we begin to care, de care deeply for her. Despite the effect of this, of this approach to showcase the vastness, beauty, and creativity of the cosmos, I find that some listeners are st often still wondering how to find God in the events of the story. The grandeur of the story is not enough for them, perhaps because our theological imagination is so often poorly developed. <clears throat> in an early essay, Teilhard relies on the wisdom literature of the Bible to tell a story that complements the human phenomenon, and I would say journey also. Wisdom Sophia becomes for Teilhard the sacred creative presence embedded in the cosmos, a counterpart to his cosmic Christ, to his transcendent up ahead in the future. To illustrate how this story also stimulates a sense of the sacredness of Earth, I will read parts of an adaptation of his essay that I have written. At the beginning of time, we encounter Sophia already at work within the primordial energy that is expanding and creating the space-time of the early universe. Only half-formed and still elusive, she emerges from the mist destined to grow in beauty and grace. As soon as the first traces of her presence become apparent, she assumes her mandate to nurture creation, to challenge it, to unify it, to beautify it, and ultimately to bring it back to God. With this mission as her guide, she attends to the work of transforming a world alive with potential. Let us listen as she speaks. From the very beginning, the first traces of my countenance can be seen playing over the surface of the divine fire. I am the catalyst for the ongoing creative process. I stimulate the cosmic energy and summon it to follow my lead. 
from within the heart of matter, I hold together the foundations of the universe. To release the energy stored within those early particles and to assist me in my task of producing greater complexity, I have developed the process of creative union and coded it into the very fabric of the cosmos. Fortified with this guiding principle, I attempt to persuade fragments of matter to come together. I begin by stirring up within the particles a deep desire to hold fast to something outside themselves, to attempt to unite with the other, to become something more. I rejoice as the protons that swarm about in the fiery plasma and usually repel, eventually come close enough to fuse. As the early universe continues to expand and cool, I encourage nuclei to attract electrons and form ions and neutral atoms. Soon ions of all sorts interact and form molecules. Always looking for ways to implement the process of creative union, I delight as gravity gathers cosmic gas and dust into the clumps that will form the first stars and galaxies. In the cores of these stars, nuclei respond to this strong nuclear force and fuse first into helium and then into more complex nuclei, building blocks that stars will share with the rest of the universe. <clears throat> these initial results hold the promise of much more diversity and beauty. Because the process of creative union is a gradual one, often beset with failure, I encourage all possible combinations, since I know that not every combination will be productive. Whenever fragments of matter do successfully unite, I make sure that they preserve their identity. As they begin to operate as a unit, I evoke new possibilities for creativity, for more fruitful interactions, and for further union. Under my influence, new creations always become more than they would have been had they failed to unite. Each step toward union drives the cosmos toward greater spontaneity and freedom, toward greater novelty, greater integrity, and ultimately toward greater consciousness. <clears throat> because transitions to novel forms are often forged by means of intense interactions, processes that unite the elements can appear undisciplined and violent. In fact, I often stir up a certain amount of instability in order to achieve the kind of atmosphere needed to make union possible. In the early universe, for instance, new elements are formed only under conditions of great volatility and high energy, often at extremes of both temperature and pressure. This is the price of, creative, of the creative process. Although the cosmos is immense, with billions of galaxies, each containing billions of stars, and many of them with intricate planetary systems, I, looked with, I look with fondness on planet Earth as she emerges from the recycled waste material of an exploding supergiant star. I thrill from within the fire of her molten lava as we swirl over Earth's surface, cool, and form her rocky crust. I am present in the gases oozing from her surface and forming her protective atmosphere. I encourage the waters of her great ocean to separate and allow dry land to form. I am the beauty running through this newly born planet encouraging it to be creative, to produce novel forms. I am fire. I am determined to make something new. And suddenly, there's life. The oceans now swarm with one-celled organisms. The yearning that I initially embedded into the fa fragments continues to be effective. Within the early life forms, I instill the sexual force in order to enhance Earth's diversity and provide new paths to union. 
I thrill to see flowers appear on the land, making Earth's face more colorful, more vibrant, and more beautiful. When I urge animals to find ways to cooperate, insects share food-finding tasks. Birds swarm to avoid predators. I am at work in the song of the birds, in the wild hum of insects, in the tireless blooming of flowers, in the unremitting work of cells, and in the endless labor of germinating seeds. With the coming of the union, human, my task becomes personal. I am pleased at last to unveil my face and be recognized, always ready to promote a richer, deeper, more spiritualized union I set about my task of alluring the conscious feature into the elusive web of my charms. I am the fragrance drawing human persons who are able to interact in new and interesting ways and to follow me freely and passionately along the road to unity. Although the gift of human freedom makes my role more difficult at times, Humans often assist me in fulfilling my mandate by conceiving new possibilities. This brings me great delight. Within the human family, I stir a passionate desire for the more, for dedication to scientific discovery, for the creation of beauty, for compassion toward those in need. In solidarity with the most vulnerable of creation, with those who yearn for the barest necessities, I sit at the city gates at the crossroads of a world in crisis, begging for mercy. I attempt to open the eyes of each person to the presence of pain and suffering in the world. Whenever and wherever possible, I encourage tender compassion, forgiveness, and sacrificial love, attitudes that characterize the sensitive soul. I am hope, breaking into history, appearing in the most unexpected places. I am love, a wild and daring cosmic love, <clears throat> as strong as the sexual force between lovers, as tender as the nurturing love of a parent, as fruitful as a vineyard in late summer. Embedded within the collective heart brain that is weaving a web of fibers over planet Earth, I gather all who care to join me in my mission, what thrills me most is the rich potential that I find among so many members of the human family. Because of their ability to care for one another, to communicate with one, or one another, and to collaborate in highly complex ways, because of their capacity to see into the future, to imagine outcomes, and to accept a goal greater than themselves, my expectations for creative union are raised to new heights. I gradually draw the human family into freedom and focus my attention on my next major task, teaching humanity to bear the burden of a greater consciousness, to harness psychic energy, and to transform this energy so that all may be one. Imagining a world permeated by Sophia's presence, we see more clearly our true place within the Earth community and experience communion with all of nature. We are made from energy that emerged from the Big Bang. The stars have fashioned the elements that our bodies need for life. Sun's energy provides light and heat. Our lives depend critically on clean air and water, on nourishing food for our bodies and beauty for our souls. Viewed from Sophia's perspective, nature is not ours to exploit. Rather, all is precious within her loving embrace. <clears throat> her care and concern extend to the smallest elementary particle, as well as to the largest cluster of galaxies, to the most ancient form of bacteria, as well as to each and every person who lives today. Coming to know Sophia satisfies those who learn, yearn to know the imminent personal presence that energizes our cosmos. As a complement to journey, Sophia's story engenders a deep relationship with that personal power at the heart of our unfolding cosmos, 
and deep reverence for the sacredness of nature. With Teilhard, we begin to recognize Sophia everywhere. Like him, we more easily and wholeheartedly dedicate ourselves to new levels of consciousness and transformative love. Thank you. Uh, so we turn now to uh, Christina Vannon, uh, one of our neighbors from the north, <laughs> who comes to us from uh, St. Jerome's University in Waterloo, Ontario. Um, she brings together, uh, quite uniquely, I think, Thomas Berry, Tehard, and Ignatius of Loyola. Thank you. So I need to say my own thank you for these two rich days of conversation but also to all of you for your ongoing attentiveness and sticking to it. Uh, although I'll tell you, it's, uh, you may not want to be sitting up here, but these seats are much more comfortable than <laughs> yours. <laughs> so I'm happy to be up here right now. The title of my paper is A Spiritual Heart for the Ecological Age. What I want to offer are some of my ongoing thinking about the nature of the transformation that we're needing to undergo and about the relationship between that transformation and cosmological spirituality. So I'm going to start by saying a little bit about why such a transformation is needed, a little bit about the nature of this transformation, and then look at some resources that might help us in the process. Thomas suggests that the deepest cause of the devastation of the natural world is a consciousness in human beings that says, as we've heard so much two days, that only we have value, that other beings have meaning and value, not in and of themselves, but only when we use them. He describes the alienation that results from this consciousness this way. While we have more scientific knowledge of the universe than any people ever had, it is not the type of knowledge that leads to an intimate presence within a meaningful universe. Our world of human meaning is no longer coordinated with the meaning of our surroundings. Our children no longer learn how to read the great book of nature from their own direct experience. They seldom learn where their water comes from or where it goes. We no longer coordinate our human celebrations with the great liturgy of the heavens. We no longer hear the voice of the rivers, the mountains, or the sea. The world about us has become an it rather than a thou. Thomas's invitation and challenge to rethink who I am as a human being, who we are as a species, has struck a deep chord in me since I was first introduced to him 30 years ago, and I'll say thank you to Stephen Dunn for that. The shift, the rethinking that Thomas has in mind is profound, and I have find it quite different from what many others are saying, especially in the Christian conversation. The shift is not simply about appreciating nature more, about caring for the natural world more or better, if, in the meantime, while we are appreciating and caring, we still understand ourselves and live as if we are fundamentally separate from this natural world. The shift that Thomas is talking about is for the sake of developing a deep intimacy and presence with every being. Yet, this is so difficult for me, I think for any one of us to do, to continue to do, to sustain. Thomas says, every one of us lives in a universe, but seldom do we have any real sense of living in a world of sunshine by day and under the stars at night. Seldom do we listen to the wind or feel the refreshing rain, except as inconveniences to escape from as quickly as possible. Consequently, we do live our daily lives in a world of objects, not a world of subjects. 
we don't have enough contact with the natural world. We do regard it as a backdrop to our human undertakings. And indeed, so often for all of us, it has little connection with what we think is meaningful in life. So our alienation from the natural world is so extensive, it seems to me, that we are often not even aware uh, that we are alienated. Even the idea that we should have an integral and intimate relationship with the natural world lies so far outside our horizons that it makes it difficult for us to even contemplate the idea. So over the past few years, I've been turning to the thought of Canadian philosopher and theologian Bernard Lonergan to help me understand and think about the nature and the complexity of the kind of transformation that Thomas Berry is talking about. And here I'm looking particularly at what uh, Lonergan has to say on conversion. For Lonergan, social breakdowns occur because of the cumulative effect of human beings being inattentive, unintelligent, unreasonable, irresponsible, and unloving. So the only way to reverse such social breakdowns is to then begin to operate as what he calls fully authentic subjects. And fully authentic subjects are always striving to be attentive, intelligent, reasonable, responsible, loving. Operating as fully authentic subjects requires conversion, ongoing, day to day, minute by minute sometimes conversion. It's about a radical change in our horizons, in our self-understanding, in the way we operate in the world. I'm going to focus here only on, the need, on, on that first imperative, the need to be attentive as a critical step in the ongoing daily process of ecological conversion. And here I've been turning recently to contemporary nature writers who I find to be important guides for teaching us how to be truly attentive to the natural world. And that in that attentiveness, we learn not only about our fellow creatures in the natural world, but we learn a good deal and can learn a good deal about ourselves. Thomas Lo Fleischner, editor of The Way of Natural History, says, natural history is a practice of intentional, focused attentiveness and receptivity to the more than human world. Attention is prerequisite to intimacy. Natural history, then, is a means of becoming intimate with the world. He goes on to say that attentiveness to nature matters because, in a very fundamental sense, we are what we pay attention to. So our attention is precious, he says. And what we choose to focus it on has enormous consequences. What we choose to look at, to listen to, these choices change the world. Only a few pages into her book, Crow Planet, Essential Wisdom from the Urban Wilderness, Leanda Lynn Hopt says, an intimate awareness of the continuity between our lives and the rest of life is the only thing that will truly conserve the earth. So she goes on to say, but how exactly are we to attain this kind of intimacy with the natural world if, for most of us, we live at a remove from nature, as most of us, she says, do in our urban and suburban homes? Do we, she asks, need then to travel off to go and be with nature, to go to far off places, participate in wildlife adventures, whatever? Her answer is that this kind of notion that we have to go somewhere creates a disconnect between our daily living, which we tend to think or we behave as if it has nothing to do with nature, and wilderness, which we tend to regard then as true nature. 
Instead, she argues and says, it is precisely in our everyday lives, in our everyday homes, that we eat, consume energy, run the faucet, compost, flush, learn, and live. It is here in our lives that we must come to know our essential connection to the wilder earth, because it is here in the activity of our daily lives that we most surely affect this earth for good or for ill." End quote. We are connected to the natural world then in and through our everyday lives. Our everyday lives are part of an emerging, evolving cosmic story. Truly coming to know this requires us, she challenges, to start walking the paths of our neighborhoods, to start knowing, paying attention, to the breadth of all of our neighbors, human and non-human alike, on and off the concrete, above and below the soil. In 1999, the Jesuit Jim Prophet invited me to become part of a working group that supports the work of the Jesuit Ecology Project, and that's one of the social justice initiatives of the Jesuits in English Canada. And when Jim was there and working, the Ecology Project was housed, therefore, at Ignatius Jesuit Centre in Guelph, Ontario. And with him and other members of the working group, I had the opportunity to work on a number of eight-day ecology retreats that we called mysticism of earth, retreats rooted in the discipline of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. The spiritual exercises grew out of Ignatius's own experience of seeking to grow in union with God and to discern God's will for him. All the notes and the prayers and the meditations and the reflections that Ignatius kept throughout his journey eventually were framed into a retreat. The four, quote-unquote, weeks of the exercises are structured around the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what we do in the ecology retreats is take this rich, extensively practiced, meaningful spiritual discipline and aim to transform it into the context of the comprehensive, sacred universe. Thinking back to some of yesterday's conversation, these retreats are held in silence. And that silence helps people to develop a practice of deep, intentional attention to the natural world, to learn the sacredness of the earth community and develop the capacity to live out of the horizon of ultimate divine loving. So each individual day of the retreat invites participants to reflect on specific themes, from listening to what the voices of the community of life right there at Ignatius Jesuit Center have to say to us about God's love for the whole universe and for each being, reflecting on the impact of our participation in ecological sin, noticing how we experience the divine presence and Earth's capacity for healing, practicing a meditative walk, pondering what it means that God is intimately present in the passion and suffering of the Earth, celebrating the hope of the resurrection for the whole of creation, and finally contemplating how we are to respond in love and live our lives as members of an integral, comprehensive, sacred community. Everyday retreatants are invited to pray by walking the land, being attentive to the many voices to be heard on the land, to hearing the voice of God in and through the voice of every creature. Each day also includes a celebration of the sacrament of the Eucharist at a specific location on the 240 hectares of property we have. And that, those celebrations are further invite people to integrate their Christian story with the story of the earth and the universe. All of these aspects of the retreat are meant to help people develop our capacity for wonder and joy as well as for critical, self-reflective awareness of our responsibility to, for the future of the whole community of life. A capacity 
that Ignatius pushes us to continue to develop in our day-to-day lives. For me, this is an embodiment of the cosmological spirituality that Thomas has in mind when he says, we need a spirituality that emerges out of a reality deeper than ourselves, a spirituality that is as deep as the earth process itself, that is born out of the solar system and even out of the heavens beyond the solar system. Another way in which the center is providing opportunities for people to experience this new comprehensive spirituality and to be more attentive is through the stations of the cosmos. Thomas Berry insists that it is our attentiveness to and understanding of the comprehensive story that will provide us with a functional cosmology to transform our alienated and separated consciousness. At Ignatius Jesuit Center, we decided to tell this comprehensive story with 25 stations that celebrate many of the significant moments of grace that are part of the story of the universe. This is the third place I know of. We, had, uh, we developed one at Holy Cross Center in Port Burwell. I got to visit one. Uh, the Mary Knoll sisters have one in the Philippines, Baguio, and this is the third one I've had a chance to be a part of. Each station is marked by images and photographs that help us situate our human story between, be, within the incredible cosmological story. The opportunity to walk these stations is an opportunity to overcome our distance and nurture a relationship of profound presence and intimacy to the community of life. So, we are most true to ourselves when we are attentive to the community of life within which we live. When we strive to understand the nature and role of all members of that community. When we affirm that it is the whole of the cosmos that is the comprehensive context of our being. And so we value the whole of that cosmos and take it into consideration when we make choices. This, I think, is the essence of human authenticity, and it is the basis of ecological conversion or transformation. It is the foundation of a cosmological spirituality that changes our hearts and our minds and makes it possible for us to become with God knowers, co-healers, and lovers of all that exists. Thank you. Thank you so much to the similarities and uniqueness of each of these presentations, and uh, we have comments, questions coming from the group. Um, Thank you for your talks. Um, I was just wondering if you could uh, speak to any or the possibility of uh, creating a... um, a type of religious order that could organize these kind, this kind of spiritual formation. This has been a wonderful conference, but it's been very academic, and so I wonder if any, if there, if that's a possibility, you comment on that. Mm-hmm. Do we do that now? Um, I th- do you want to get all the questions first? Yeah. yeah. More questions. Someone back there had. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, throughout the weekend, we've heard a lot about the two books, the book of nature and the biblical book. My instinct is that you see the two books as standing in a kind of perfect relationship to one another. And my instinct is that Barry thinks the same, a kind of isomorphism between the Bible on the one hand and the book of nature on the other with the Bible, with Genesis to Revelation being a story about land, about rivers, about the tree of life at the center of the story. And in that case, the human salvation drama is a kind of uh, bit story within that larger drama. But is that the case? Do, Do you see the two books as in perfect sort of harmony with one another? 
or are there tensions between the biblical books and the book of nature that you'd like to speak to? Thank you. Kathleen, I, I'd like to understand when you speak of Sophia as a physicist, how do you think about the correspondence between that, between that naming and the interiority that physicists work with so much about the interiority of matter? Although they don't speak of it in terms of meaning, but they do speak of it as having self-organizing creative mm -hmm. emergence. And how would, how would the physicist, you as a physicist, name that Sophia? Mm -hmm. Where's the, la the congruence in the two pictures? Thank Thank you. Um, I appreciate very much when you can give examples of how in, in different ways that people are incorporating or expanding their religious consciousness. And I just would add one to the Stations of the Cross that, that you mentioned, Chris, three different examples. I know of one more, more in the Philippines where a a priest working with indigenous people developed a Stations of the Cross of, for the death of the forest and began with the, door, the forest is condemned to death. The forest it goes through the whole uh, tradition that we know, the Stations mm -hmm. of the Cross for the death of the forest, which came from the experience of the, indi of the uh, indigenous people themselves. So I think whenever we can help one another imagine new ways of, of integrating. It is a very powerful aid. So thank you for your examples. Okay, so I think at this point, um, why don't each of you respond to the question you want to respond to or that attracts you? You, know, you don't have to answer all of them, but uh, and then we'll see what's left, and then we'll come up with another answer, response sure. if we need to. Okay, okay. so, so uh, uh, I'd like to try to answer or to say something to the question about the perfect harmony uh, between the two books of of the universe and of or of creation and of scripture. And I just want to read, kind of remind myself of the things that Father Thomas would say. Uh, first of all, the universe is the primordial revelation. And primordial, I think, trumps it in terms of expansiveness and having its own rationale, which is utterly mysterious to the human. In some sense, it's what we're trying to parse out and comprehend in the way that we do our kind of gloss on the book of nature, which in some sense, I think, is the way... Um, uh, within our tradition, according to the, this teaching and this school of the two books that we understand scripture to be. Thomas also wants to say that the universe is the only text without a context. So I think, again, that gives us another way of approaching these. And, and then finally, Father Thomas would have taught that there are four scriptures, actually, and that the universe is, as we've said, the primordial, the first, um, there is the, the scripture of historical unfolding of the human story. There's the human psychological story, the story of human interiority. And then there are the various and multiple scriptures of the religious worlds that are intended to be somehow illuminations on these more primordial shared and universal texts. Yes, and I guess on that same, um, that same question, um, it seems to me that the Bible, we have some attitudes and ideas that are not helpful. Whereas if we begin with the universe itself and, and know the nature of, of the universe, just as um, you know, someone might <clears throat> describe a person to you, 
And if you just go on that description, you might not really ever get to know that person in, in depth. Whereas if we start with the universe without the descriptions, you know, sometimes we can get more intimate. And I think intimacy is such an important part of that. But I have Mary's question to answer too. And I think, um, I mean, Teilhard uh, writes this essay called The Spiritual Power of Matter. And I think what, it, what it's about is this marvelous potential that we see as we watch what happens to those particles. I mean, they come together and make something new. I mean, it's happening all the time, and I tried to highlight that through the story. Um, it, something, it, it's, it's emerging, at, you know, at each level. You have an emergence of something new that can't be done. I mean, if you put, you know, two particles together in a box, it's not gonna, they're not going to fuse into something new. <clears throat> so that you have all of this newness coming out of, um, uh, of un union. And I think that's a place where we can look back at, or look back at nature and see what, you know, what is the call to the human. <clears throat> union will also bring us to another level, a new consciousness, which we're all talking about. You know, how do we, how do we meet that? And so there, you know, at, at each level we're, 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 um, exploiting, maybe that's not a good word, but it, it, um, tapping into the potential that's in matter. And who knows what the future will bring. Uh, somebody asked about uh, forming of a new religious order. No, I'm not gonna remember. Uh, I, I, what comes to mind is the Green Mountain Monastery um, in Vermont, uh, Gail Worcello and Bernadette. Yeah. I'm forgetting Bernadette's last name. And yeah. So, uh, and in fact, so that's their whole dedication is 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 working on this. And uh, so, it's a, it is a new order. Um, and if you go and visit the monastery, you will also have the privilege of uh, visiting where Thomas Berry is buried. So it's wonderful. It's a beautiful place to go and be. Uh, thank you, Jane, for telling me about those Stations of the Cross. I didn't know about those in the Philippines. At, at, uh, at Ignatius Jesuit Center, we have a sort of, uh, we have the, the primary 25 stations, and then um, there's a, a set of um, other stations connected to it, uh, uh, which are also about the, the Stations of the Cross. And what, what we did uh, was, a, I had a chance to work with some high school students on artwork for those stations. And it was real um, privilege, but also challenge of working with uh, kids in grade 11, 10, 11, trying to invite them to take a traditional um, telling of the story of Jesus through the Stations of the Cross and inviting them to uh, produce some artwork that would talk about Jesus as uh, the passion and death of Jesus as uh, the passion and death of the earth. So what does it mean for Jesus to be suffering with the earth or Jesus to be crucified or whatever? Uh, and uh, it's extraordinary artwork. Um, so, and, it, and it sits in, together with uh, uh, artistic rendering of the more traditional stations. So, and if you go to, to Ignatius, you can, you can see the original and you can see the, the, them out on the stations, the property itself. Uh, which for me p makes me think about the question about whether there are tensions between the book of nature and the book of scripture. Uh, um, they're both, they're alive and evolving. So there's always more to be, uh, to be asked about, more to be um, interpreted, and they, they need to be in conversation with each other. Um, and, and, and so at times I think the, there absolutely is a lot of challenging going on. And I think uh, for right now within Christianity, as we've been asked to think about Christian responses, it's about really taking seriously what, what we are learning from the book of nature in our own time and what difference that's making to how we're going to deal with the scriptures, the, the, the traditional scriptures. So I'll stop there. So we're Mary getting Evelyn's very getting strong messages from our timekeeper down on the floor here. So we want to really thank this panel for their evocative work and for the liveliness of your responses. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you darling. Thank you. I appreciate it.